This week on Writers Inc. The pace of politics generally has a sort of thriller pace to it. I think you, you, it, it's quick, it's fast, things happen, the most unlikely plot twists. Um, every character has a secret in their backstory, um, some scandal that you have to dig up. So it's, yeah, it's certainly not a bad um, place to work if you're going to try and be a thriller writer or a mystery writer. It's, it's, uh, it's got all, lots of the ingredients you need to write a great mystery. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets, what does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out. School's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. J.P. Reinflush. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So I'm excited. We've got like a foot of snow coming on Sunday. First, first oh, snowfall nice. of the year. Robot lawnmower is primed and ready to go. My daughter's got her, her snowsuit, like already out in the mud room, ready to, to get out there. And it, th- this freaking storm better hit. That's all. Uh, <laughs> you're just if, waiting if outside start, with the video yeah. or it didn't happen. I want to see this thing in action. Right. Oh, it's oh, yeah. be all over Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, will, I will record it. I, I'm guessing it's going to probably pull off its base. It'll get like maybe four feet and run into a wall and just stop. <laughs> like, it's, it's not going to it's not going to plow anything. And I'll be out there with a, a shovel and my, my other snowblower trying to just get rid of 12 inches of snow, which is is a lot. <laughs> this whole idea makes me nervous. The whole like automated lawnmower, automated snowblower, like one one like errant chipmunk gets sucked into that thing and it's just a massacre i i already turned off the person sensor like i, oh, no. <laughs> I, I don't i don't want safeguards i want this thing to just kind of run amok just in the driveway turning it towards your- <laughs> <laughs> what's going on with you guys oh we had a couple of flakes here but it's been more heat i'm gonna tell you the stupidest thing that i did yesterday heat. yeah so i was making pasta sauce yesterday putting in my sprinkle of hot chili flakes and i spilled the whole bag on the burner (laughs) on the burner if you've ever had chili smoke (laughs) inside your trachea and your lungs that hurts i like wiped it off so quick but like the damage is done it was just like hot chili Mm -hmm. smoke in my whole kitchen i i I didn't do that (laughs) anything quite that bad but i did spill now here's where i'm gonna have to try to pronounce something no one can pronounce but i did spill an entire bottle of Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire. All over my kitchen. Is it Worcestershire? I've always said Worcestershire. It's like the worst. Uh, it's the worst I, assured sauce. Worcestershire. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someone can tell us. I personally don't buy it because I can't pronounce it. Perfect. <laughs> is that the is that <laughs> I, I the guideline? I, 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 don't, I don't I don't allow I don't allow it in my life just because <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Now we know. That's a good yeah. rule. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just hide, hide from anything I can't deal with. That's that's gotten me this far. <laughs> JP, what have you spilled on things? What? Why are you asking that? Question? I'm because it's so far, <laughs> Christine, and I, we we the spilled worst, things in the kitchen. The worst thing that has happened is I accidentally inhaled burning sulfur. And fun fact: uh, when sulfur is burning and it touches anything wet or mucus, it turns into uh, hydrosulfic uh, acid. So uh, nice. it burned my my nose. <laughs> It hurt, and oh, I learned my lesson. <laughs> That's a horrible story. There you go. Right. Now you know. <laughs> all right. Uh, on that happy note, what what's in the news, JP? Uh, all right. First up, millions wasted on an attempt to create nationwide UK library website. Uh, the UK's initiative for a nationwide library website, uh, Single Digital Presence, now called Library On, has, critici- has been criticized for delays and uh, indecisions despite years of effort and about six million pounds spent. 
Uh, Tim Coates, the ex-Waterstones boss and library campaigner, uh, expressed frustration with this progress, uh, project's lack of progress, uh, highlighting a failure to provide easy access to the country's library collections, um, criticizing the project's excessive consul consultations, ignoring public demand uh, for straightforward access to library resources, and ultimately, um, Part of this project's delay is attributed to concerns that digital presence could lead to more physical library closures, despite the strong need for that digital complement. Now, isn't I mean, one of the first, main let reasons? Let me register for my shock that some government-funded program has uh, <laughs> has not produced results. Go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> I'm just trying to think this through. Like, isn't the purpose of a library to have like a community, like local something or other for, for books, like by having a, a national version, doesn't that do away with that? I mean, obviously it's a smaller, you know, place than like the, the U S like we're, you know, but I, I don't know, maybe it's just a difference in the cultures, but like that would never fly here in the States for sure. I know, um, in, in Wisconsin that they have a, a statewide, uh, digital library. At least they have like multiple libraries that are kind of interconnected and, and it ends up having huge waiting lists for really popular books. But I think what it does is it prevents those smaller libraries from taking the brunt of costs for digital by having a broader access so that you as an individual in a small town could have access to a book that your library may not otherwise purchase. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was reading this. I guess the UK has 150 library authorities, which I'm assuming are umbrellas, each with their own computer system, and they can't get them all mm -hmm. working together. So I think in bigger countries, there's probably very little hope of having a unified digital <laughs> library. <laughs> if only. Next up. Uh, Gen Z and millennials just might save libraries. Uh, the American Library Association study reveals a notable trend. 54% of Gen Z and millennials frequented libraries last year, uh, which is a higher rate compared to older generations. Uh, contrary to the digital stereotype, these younger generations are showing the strong preference for physical books, purchasing double the amount of print books compared to eBooks monthly. Uh, even those younger generations uh, who don't consider themselves avid readers are using those library resources resources, including digital collections and those programs uh, beyond book lending. Uh, libraries that adapt to this digital age and offering things like coding clubs and uh, job support are really appealing to those tech savvy and, and collaborative nature that uh, Gen Z and millennials have. Well, this is cool because Gen Zers and mill millennials, they don't work, right? So they've, they've got all this time on their hands. <laughs> Perfect. <too>. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's it. I'm just kidding. I, 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 saw, I saw a story yesterday. It has nothing to do with this, but it was, it was about um, a company that had required their workers to start coming back in the office after everybody had been working remote. Um, so rather than come in for a full day, their employees were coming in, you know, basically clocking in with their, their ID card, getting a cup of coffee and then leaving. But, you know, they, they were basically, yeah, they, they were there for, you know, long enough to, to clock in for the day or whatever to, to meet the, the company requirement. And like, it just got me thinking about that. But um, <laughs> yeah, fa fa fantastic to see people reading physical books. I mean, my, my wife is a diehard fan of physical books. Like she refuses to use a Kindle. Like she will, like she'll, she'll be in bed with like a copy of it, you know, like a five down five pound book and her book light and her hand is shaking, trying to hold the whole thing up, but like, she will do that before she'll, she'll use a Kindle. So, yeah, I wonder if, uh, if the social media aspect of, of books with, you know, uh, influencers posting with books or book talk where they have the physical book in their hand when they're talking about it, if that sort of has been influencing these generations to want to, yeah. um, either emulate that or just have that experience. That's interesting. I, I was just watching, um, I'm glad to see kind of a resurgence of interest in libraries, but I was just watching someone on YouTube who was talking about how he's replacing all the different services he was paying for with library stuff and all the way down to like, he listens to audio books, of course, you know, that stuff's available, but like, you know, magazines and, you know, mm -hmm. there's, I didn't realize this, but there are, there's a library app that has like every single magazine publication in it so that you could read digitally. So like he's just systematically re replacing like Spotify and YouTube and all kinds of other things, yeah. uh, all with free library services. So that's cool. I like that a lot. Yeah. I kind of fall in the middle. I, if I read an ebook that I really like, I'll pick up the hardcover just to have it on the shelf. Like that's I, me. I like mm -hmm. do that. yeah. That's yeah. what mm -hmm. I do too. And I, I hate to admit it, but um, it's just because I'm reading glasses resistant and then I can make the text bigger on my Kindle. <laughs> I'm like text. I'm not getting <laughs> reading Honestly, glasses. I, I rely a lot on the Kindle. 
and my in the Kindle apps because of all the travel and you know it's because yeah. it, it's very hard on the back to carry like mm-hmm. you know thirty or forty books with. And <laughs> yeah, I do tend to read a lot of different things. It is. Um, when I would travel before I had a Kindle, I remember I'd weighed my suitcase and it was over the limit. And they're like, oh, it's usually just shoes. And then the lady watched this. I just pulled out like book after book. And she was like, how many books do you have in that suitcase? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Last up in the news, uh, January 1st, 2024 is Public Domain Day. So uh, numerous books, films, musical compositions and other works from 1928 and some from 1923, um, which included some works from Virginia Woolf, Agatha Christie, D.H. Lawrence and the iconic Steamboat Willie uh, and movies like The Passion of Joan of Arc uh, entered the U.S. public domain, uh, along with free use and adaptation. Uh, allowing for this. Uh, The public domain collection showcases a variety of 1920s cultural struggles, offering insights into things like capitalism, gender and sexuality, the Harlem Renaissance, and the aftermath of World War I. So uh, while the U.S. sees these works entering the public domain, international copyright laws will vary, um, affecting that global distribution and usage rights. This is good news for me in my new book, uh, Fellowship of the Steamboat Willie. Great. <laughs> Which is, look for that soon. Which is a spiritual successor. <laughs> there, the, the, this this is not a joke. I actually saw a trailer for Steamboat Willie, a slasher movie. Yeah. So like, yeah. Yeah. he's already got this ready to, ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, well they, they already did Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, yeah another yeah. Winnie yeah. the Pooh book came out in the House of Pooh Corner this year. But yeah, they did Winnie the Pooh. Um, but yeah, I mean, in all honesty, though, Winnie the Pooh is a scary motherfucker. That's true. <laughs> uh, oh, always has been. <laughs> Endless Noted. void of Pro- honey. <laughs> <laughs> Says the guy who turned off the human sensor on his snowboard. <laughs> yeah. I saw Call of Cthulhu uh, is out too. And it's funny because uh, I guess maybe because there have been so many Lovecraft pastiches, I didn't realize that because so many people do it. But now you can do Call of Cthulhu if you wanted to use any of those characters, if you can remember any of them, if there are any other than Cthulhu. <laughs> I, but, <laughs> I'm just I'm I'm kind of baffled by how there's still works that are under copyright for like Virginia Woolf and Agatha yeah. Christie at this point. That's that well, they seems do like extensions the, so long ago. Yeah, and then there's you know if you are going to use these, just be careful because sometimes later versions or adaptations of the original mm-hmm. works, movies, translations are still copyrighted. So. Do your due diligence if you're going to do Mickey Mouse slashing. I don't know. I think in light of all the conversations around things like plagiarism and copyright violation and stuff like that, I mean, just let's let's just avoid all that. I mean, yeah, it's fun to kind of kick around the idea of a of a Steamboat Willie slasher movie, uh, but I think people are just asking for trouble. And and why do that? <laughs> why not create something original? You you won't go and see it. I'll I'll be there. Yeah, me too. Oh, I'm going to go see it. I mean, let's just <laughs> let's just be realistic. I, I I have to see it, but I my I guess my plea is like, do we really need this sort of thing? Like, we got to start seeing some more creative, original work. You know, like I watched um the creator. Did you guys have you guys seen that film? Uh, mm-hmm. it's a sci-fi film. It was shot on oh basically, yeah, I've heard of it. You know, prosumer cameras. Uh, and I thought it was incredible. I thought it was a great film, great special effects. It had, it had a budget. I mean, it had a, I think it was like $10 million budget, which is pretty low by like Hollywood standards. But what, what I loved is it like, it was an original story an original set of characters, you know, in a, in a, in an era where we're seeing a whole lot of like remakes or, you know, things that I guess could be considered satirical or something, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just out, I'm out looking for independent creators to, to just inundate us with new stuff. Let's just, let's just start fresh 2024. Let's, let's make this the year of original content. Well, books at this yeah, point we- really don't go out of print with, with eBooks out there. I, a lot of author friends that I know have been really chasing copyright, trying to figure out ways to basically prevent it from ever expiring. Um, a lot of authors are transferring their copyrights to a trust. And then as long as that trust is alive, the copyright never expires. Um, you know, if, if you're an author and you're selling well, you should definitely talk to an attorney about, about that kind of thing because, you know, your, your heirs, you know, that, that they can profit from this, you know, long yeah. after you're gone if, if you structure it properly. So somebody, 
somebody, whoever created Steamboat Willie is is rolling in their grave right now. Um, and they're about to lose a little bit of money because somebody be, was able to make that movie. Well, that would be Walt <laughs> Disney and his frozen did, head is spinning <laughs> in its little container right now. Did, did he actually create it, though? I, I thought he, he, he created Steamboat Willie. Yeah. I oh, thought he did. someone okay. else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought Maybe he got that. He it. bought it from yeah, somewhere, or yeah. uh, I don't, I don't well, know. it all started with a rabbit. Uh, but yeah, and originally it was going to be Mortimer Mouse. And we can go into a whole. We can do all this. I, I've read all this. I've studied all this. If if I'm wrong about him being the origin originator of Steamboat Willie, uh, I will be shocked. But let someone let me know. I'm willing to apologize. I am not up on my Disney trivia, but yeah, I'm so. I, I have no opinion on that one way or the other. <laughs> I kind of obsessed. I'm, 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 I, I would love to sort of replicate what he did in a way, uh, the way he created, you know, the, the empire that eventually became Disney. But uh, there's other things he did that I would not want to replicate. Let's just say. Oh. <laughs> I, I would. Fair. Let, let me know when Kevin Land opens. Kevin Land. Kevin Land <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> to a a swamp area near you. Well, we're gonna go buy up all the swamp land somewhere. Perfection. Somewhere Houston's got a lot of bayous. We'll do that. Awesome. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by AutoCrit. One of the most value packed memberships for any author. AutoCrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. AutoCrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level, so you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right. No renewal fees. Hi, this is JD Barker. I've used AutoCrit for years and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to AutoCrit for sponsoring the show. JD, who's up this week? This week we've got Matthew Blake on. He's a London-based novelist and screenwriter. He's here to discuss his debut thriller. It's called Anna O. Um, this is one of those titles that just caught fire immediately as soon as they put the pitch out there. It just it sold for ungodly sums of money worldwide. Um, he's going to tell us all about that process. Th- these kind of things always always fascinate me, um, you know, because they they seem like they're very rare and they are, but but they do happen. You know, like at least once or twice a year we hear about an author that that basically strikes gold with a very unique idea. This is one of them. Uh, so here he is, Matthew Blake. So your book, Anna O, oh, coming out January 2nd, is being called one of the most talked about debuts of the year. So that's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's the whole thing's been a, a massive whirlwind, really. It's uh, ever since it went out on submission and got all the sort of amazing response globally, over 30 territories. I was in the US and Canada recently on a pre-pub tour meeting booksellers and everything so it's just been a complete joy from start to finish that's excellent i want to definitely talk about that some more but i would like to start at the beginning how did you get started writing well i've always written really i um always wanted to do it always loved um storytelling but particularly mysteries and thrillers and cliffhangers and um so i that's always what i naturally gravitated towards i Thought I might be a journalist when I was a student. I edited the the my student newspaper at the university I was at. Um, so and then I became a political speech writer. So I've always always written, but uh, the books were always the thing I wanted most to do. So uh, I was always scribbling away in evenings and in spare moments, and uh, uh, yeah. So that that was always the end goal. Wow! And Anna O is your first published novel. Is that yes, correct? Yes. 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 So how many books had you written before this novel was acquired? <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, uh, a secret that will remain between me and uh, a drawer in my study. Uh, that will be... <laughs> <laughs> so a few <laughs> then. <laughs> many scripts seem to be burned. But no, I, I mean, obviously, yeah, I, I, I'd done some when I was a student and I'd um, uh, always been... Um, 
having a go at at uh, various ideas and um i think i think was particularly with a, a mystery or a thriller the um it's so much about structure about story that i, I think it takes um quite a while to to get good at that really i think you have to have a lot of practice and a lot of effort and um so yeah no, i had a sort of apprenticeship but then uh anna Rowe was the the one where it all clicked nice so had you finished other novels before or is this kind of the first one that you finished well um yeah i i, I suppose i had finished but uh not to the the levels of uh of uh of this but yeah no, i got to the end and you know um uh, so that was uh, all good, but uh, I think for a, a novel to come together, you've got the, so many moving pieces. You've got to um, obviously have fantastic characters that everyone's involved with, wonderful cliffhangers and twists, but then also that that um, big, bold, noisy, attention-grabbing premise, which is going to make you stand out amongst the 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 sea of other titles the the thousands upon thousands of other titles so i think getting all those things together is something that takes uh takes a long time i think um yeah the others had some of those elements but anna Rowe was the first one where all those pieces pieces came together yeah and this one definitely has an interesting premise so we can dig into it that does, a yeah. little bit <laughs> <laughs> um tell me about the job you were working at the time of your debut so I was uh, working in politics here in uh, the UK. So um, in uh, in Parliament, very sort of ancient historic building. It looks a bit like a sort of uh, cross between a, a church and a palace. It's uh, so lots of shadowy, narrow corridors and um, uh, interesting politicians and lots of sort of buzz and right at the centre of things. So it's a great, it's great sort of apprenticeship. Pick up lots of um, insights into human nature and. Um, understanding the way power works, understanding the way the world works a bit more. I think it's um, a great education in life, really, to work in in politics. It's it's eye-opening in many ways, but um, and particularly because I was writing speeches and doing things like that, you learn to write to deadlines, you learn to write clearly, and you learn how to try and uh, grab people's attention. You know, you, you can't be uh you can't be boring with that so um or at least you try not to be boring with that <laughs> so so yeah in all those ways i think it was a it was a great great education for me so you think speech writing translates into novel writing i i think i think um the pace of politics generally has a sort of thriller pace to it i think you you it, it's quick it's fast things happen the most unlikely plot twists um every character has a secret in their backstory um some scandal that you have to dig up so it's yeah it's certainly not a bad um place to work if you're going to try and be a thriller writer or a mystery writer it's, it's uh it's got all lots of the ingredients you need to write a great mystery and so you said when you're writing a speech, just like a thriller, you have to grab attention. How yes. do you think about that? Like, what tips would you have for, oh, here's something you can use to kind of grab a reader's or a listener's attention? Well, I mean, I think uh, one of the things is defining, you know, how big you want your audience to be really and obviously if you're in politics and you're trying to speak to a nation or a, a large group of people you need to tap into their concerns you know they while people in westminster might be hugely concerned with some very sort of niche bit of um you know economic policy people in a nation at large are concerned that prices are going up in the supermarket or the streets aren't safe so i think you always have to First, understand what people's concerns are, understand the audience. And, uh, you know, all great politicians on both sides of the Atlantic or around the world are masters at understanding their electorates and um, touching people's hearts in a way. I think the greatest politicians do that. They can do the high, the high flown abstract stuff, but they fundamentally can talk to people's concerns and I think that's what makes it memorable really there's no shortcut to that you've got to know what people and particularly in, in thrillers or mysteries what people are scared of and um with Anna O, when I came across the phenomenon of sleep I, that's when that sort of antennae started flashing because that is such a um it's a preoccupation for me but I mean all eight billion of us on the planet sleep so it seemed like a 
an extremely universal fear we might have of what do we all do while we are, while we sleep. It seems something which could touch every reader on every continent, basically. Yeah, and I think um, loss of control is always a big theme in thrillers. Yeah. We're afraid yeah. of not being in control, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. And I think also there's a... Um, there's an inherent mystery to the idea of sleeping and sleepwalking because um, it is a curious phenomenon, really, that we all go, you know, we all turn off the lights, go to bed, then wake up without having realised time has passed, usually with really no knowledge of what has happened in that time, apart from vague, sort of sketchy um, memories of dreams, perhaps, that are quickly forgotten. So there's an, And if you're sleepwalking, of course, you, you commit acts while you're sleeping, which you then don't really remember when you wake up. So there's an inherent mystery there to play with of, you know, what really does happen when we go to sleep and and what might happen when we sleepwalk. So there's that that structural bit is um, just a gift for, a, for writing mis- sort of mystery thrillers because it's it's all there. Yeah. So that was something you were just kind of interested in. You're interested in sleep. And that was kind of the big what if premise. What if we committed a crime in our sleep? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I I have I mean, I have problems sleeping myself. And, you know, often you have that moment where you wake up um, and you're sort of halfway between a dream and um, reality. And, you know, often you have a dream of being chased or something which has that very Hitchcockian feel of, you know, the, they're about to get you. And and there's that amazing moment where you suddenly realise it was all a dream and it wasn't real and actually you're safe and uh, you're in normality. And I, I, I've i often thought that's an incredible... Dream seems so real, sleep seems so real. Um, and that sort of gap between sleeping and waking is very sort of blurry really i mean we 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 it's uh uh so i i always thought sleep is great is something i'm fascinated by all the people i talk to are fascinated by because they spend you know about a third of their lifetimes doing it so um and then that's when i started doing the research and coming across all this real life stuff and that's when the sort of seed of the idea sort of sprouted into into a full book plot yeah, and it looks like you kind of married a couple of things together because people do do strange things while they're sleepwalking. There yeah, have been yeah. many strange things. And then you're looking at uh, resignation syndrome, which is yes, a, yes. a real thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the research you did, how you... Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. It was, the weaker moment really was bringing together those two things. So the the first, as you said, is... Um, what we people who sleepwalk and do amazing things when they while they sleepwalk like you know stories of people getting up in the middle of the night and going for drives or going you know um motorbiking or something and you know coming back taking off their helmets going to bed waking up have no memory at all of doing this um and so that's an incredibly mysterious and interesting thing and obviously there are lots of real life cases of people who have committed you know killed someone while sleepwalking and there's lots of uh very interesting legal cases about that so that was one element of it then um but the eureka moment really came when i discovered the other mystery illnesses they they call it of resignation syndrome which is where people fall into a a deep sleep for years on end um there's no they call it a functional neurological disorder because there's no organic disease on the brain and it is as if you are just asleep um but you cannot be woken you just will not wake up um, and there's these there's lots of books written about it, but there's this famous case of uh, children in Sweden where this happened. There's examples in Kazakhstan. There's all all around the world, really. But uh, and uh, some of the top neurologists in the world have been trying to figure out what causes resignation syndrome. But it is the nearest scientific equivalent to the sort of mythic deep sleep that you might see that, you know, that we see in stories uh, going back centuries that people go into a deep sleep for years on end and uh, only wake up when something, when something happens in the world or hope is restored or so that, um, that was just totally fascinating. So when I put both of those things together, then that, that really was the light bulb moment. It was, uh, that was when Anna Rowe really sort of took life. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so you've got this idea, you're working this other job. How did you fit in writing at the same time with your job? I have to imagine it's pretty demanding. Yeah, no, no, it is. I mean, um, uh, I mean, I've been writing, you know, quite a while doing things. So you sort of, I suppose, get into a rhythm and and how you how you manage it. But um, 
uh yeah no it, it's it's always a challenge i guess i mean i think uh for me the key i knew from previous attempts was um because a mystery is so much about structure just in terms of ensuring that the you know you've got to get people in but you've also got to get people out yeah. um and you've got to sort of you, you you want that final bit to be as shocking and as uh big and and sort of uh newsy if you like as the as the opening hook so i think i spent a lot of time i spent a lot of time on the research before i got anywhere near writing it i spent so the whole thing took about four years but wow. um, spent a lot of time on the research a lot of time on thinking through the twist thinking through the sort of plotting and the uh i mean a lot of the the sort of touch points for me were uh things like agatha christie where you know she's famous for how innovative her twists are the first book i ever loved of hers was uh the murder of roger Ackroyd, which possibly has the most famous twist in all of mystery fiction and uh also things like um psycho by alfred hitchcock which again has got a sort of amazing final twist that's the sort of iconic thing um i mean it's got an amazing opening but it's sort of almost even more amazing twist so i'd always wanted to do something that had a twist on that scale something that was as big as that that um so yeah i took a lot of time figuring out how you get there what it would be how you would make it all work um and i it wasn't until i figured all that out that i that i then sat down and started writing yeah i love that and i'm not going to talk about the twist because i'm sure there was some research that went into that but i do not want to spoil it for anybody <laughs> so <laughs> they can read that on their own they can, they can. yeah <laughs> so you've talked a lot about structure and now you talked about agatha christie so did you study like craft or other authors in terms of structure before writing this yeah book? i mean mostly just through reading myself i mean uh i'm sure like a lot of your your listeners you know there's so many um writing sort of instructions out there and things i mean uh i think you can get uh very bogged down with that and and um it's quite liberating when i you know you sort of when you decide to find your own way i think and just do what works for you because um uh i think in the end that's the only way it it works so i i i um yeah, it's mostly going back to the books I loved and the authors I loved and, and just enjoying it and, and sort of uh, digesting that really rather than um, uh, looking at the theory behind it or it was just, it was, um, I mean, I think there are some some great writing books out there, but they've always need to be sort of read then sort of just pushed into the unconscious I think because uh yeah it's uh but um no definitely so the, reading all the greats reading all the sort of classic things I've read Patricia Highsmith and um I've got a sort of shelf on my wall of all the sort of my sort of 20 favorite thrillers and I could have kept looking at that thinking that's that's what I'm aiming at so um yeah it was, it was just emulating them I suppose I love that. And did you outline your novel or did you just kind of piece it together over the four years? Did you have a plan or? Yes, no, no, I did did have a plan. I mean, I always like to uh, leave enough room so those moments of sort of serendipity can happen. You know, you can make those connections. But uh, but yes, I mean, all the big stuff is planned out. It's all uh, I mean, I think a novel that any great mystery really, but when it's as complex as mm -hmm. uh as as these books are and you also you're you're dealing with um readers now who are, are more sort of twist literate if you like than any previous yeah is of you know everyone's box binged every netflix box set everyone's seen all the twists it's everyone's um very very smart about what's going to happen so trying to wrong for the reader now is is probably as hard as it's ever ever been which is a good thing it encourages writers to sort of uh you have to go even better even 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 bigger but uh yeah so trying to do that and genuinely surprise people was the the key thing i think you planning is for me at least is, is integral to that awesome so four years you've got your book how did you yeah. go about finding your agent what was that process like for you no good i mean it was uh that's when it all took off really i mean i um uh sent uh, out the uh uh 
send out the opening chapters and the synopsis and um it's yeah it was pretty instant if i'm honest it was uh uh i think i got my first reply in under an hour so it was um i think the the pitch was you know the pitch then is the pitch now it hasn't changed it's the exact same wording it, it's the opening line is the same it, it so people really really got it and uh yeah i ended up having you know uh all the big age you know over 20 agents wanting it all the big agents and um uh just went from there really but that was the first time i thought oh yeah you know it seems to have touched a nerve this 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 could go uh as big as i hoped for wow so you just sent out cold query emails and got a response in an hour yes wow so that's a good concept that's why the pitch writing is important in your queries (laughs) and then you went on submission and your book goes to auction and you have like 16 offers and 48 hours with yes. some significant money attached to it. Yes. Can yes, you talk exactly. about that? Like, how did you yeah, decide no, what well, offer to take? <laughs> complete whirlwind, really. Again, in <laughs> two weeks, it was, uh, I mean, it, it, it all happened uh, extraordinarily fast. I mean, my agent went out with it on Thursday, and by Friday, we already, uh, Friday evening, we had the, the UK, US, and Canadian offers. So, um, which was just totally life changing, really, just extraordinary. And then it sort of just went, uh, all around the world, really. So, um, yeah, it was incredible. It was the, m- by far the most exciting two weeks of my writing life. Um, and uh, that sort of groundswell of enthusiasm from all the agents that I'd got, thankfully, I was very pleased, translated into the sort of global publishing world. And and um, what was so amazing to see was that um, uh, it... it, it it translated um sort of over to to publishers everywhere really i suppose because sleep is is so universal so um you know one day you're getting an offer from uh somewhere in europe then from uh you know brazil and it's so the idea that a, a concept like that could appeal to so many readers across the world that was probably the most exciting bit of all yeah it must be a bit overwhelming though too how do you decide when you have all those offers which one you're going with do you trust your agent is it just financial are there other factors in it I, well i think it's definitely <laughs> trusting the agent i mean i think the uh uh my particular agents have got an amazing foreign rights team who know all the the publishers inside out all around the world so um uh yeah i mean it you know it, it's of obviously usually who who bids the most but um also who you think's gonna uh publish it and and sort of evangelize about it um and really sell it and um that's where the great foreign rights agents are, are invaluable because they they have all that expertise and all that knowledge that i don't have so um yeah, it's just listening to them really yeah and then uh, what about marketing plans? I saw some pictures online of ARCs going out in these beautiful boxes with sleep mm. masks with closed eyes on them. Tell me about all of that. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that was, again, fantastic. I mean, we got a sort of glimpse of that uh, when the book was acquired. That was part of the sort of pitch um, about what they're going to do with uh, with the marketing. I mean, again, um, with my sort of uh my background i mean I, i'd hoped that there was lots in there that was very marketable you know i mean the 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 title alone the 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 premise the the resignation syndrome sleepwalking there's a huge amount there to to work with and and use and so it was just amazing to see um yeah everyone pick that up and 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 run with it really it was and the design ideas and uh um on yeah in the uk in the us in canada in uh in europe it, it's just been amazing to see what these amazing marketing teams have done taking things from the books and then sort of making them visual and interactive and getting everyone excited about it nice and you've been uh we're about three weeks out from your launch as we're recording you've been yes doing tours going what have you been doing meeting booksellers meeting fans yeah so i had a great um Two weeks, I went over to uh, the US and Canada, so um, to to meet booksellers, to meet journalists. Um, uh, I did six cities in two weeks, so it was a sort of whirlwind again of um, 
of uh, meeting everyone really, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was just fantastic. I've met all the uh, Kaliba, the California Independent Booksellers Association, and uh, the journalists in New York, and booksellers in uh, DC, Boston, Atlanta. So um, it was just great. I mean, just just um, yeah, pitching people the book, telling them about it, giving them. Uh, giving them uh, early copies and just uh, getting every everyone excited. And what was fantastic was, particularly at the bookseller dinners, is as soon as you mention sleep and sleep disorders, you get the first person who sort of slightly nervously says, well, it turns out actually my daughter sleepwalks. And then the second person shouts in, well, my grandfather sleepwalked. And then before you know it, the whole table is uh, filled with everyone's got a sleep story. So I, uh, that was fantastic because he thought this is really, um, you know, everyone can relate to it. Everyone's interested in that. And um, I think by the end of it, I, I'd heard so many sleep stories. I think I'm, I, I could become a part-time sleep therapist. I think that's the uh, that's my side hustle now. <laughs> or you've got book two ideas, I guess. I don't know. Well, I'm true. true right? <laughs> so you did booksellers, and then do you have like uh, book tours coming up once the book is out to do signings? Yes, yes. Yeah. I did. So I was recently in um, Frankfurt where I met for the first time all my wonderful uh, international publishers all around the world. And uh, yeah, hopefully next year it's... Um, Hitting all the crime, the crime writing festivals all 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 around the world. That'd be absolutely fantastic. I mean, there's nothing I I love more than I love writing the books, obviously, and coming up with the ideas. But I'd absolutely love being out there and meeting readers and booksellers and selling it. it it's uh, that for me is the the total joy of seeing people engage with something you've you've come up with in your sort of at your desk. That's that's the greatest thrill of all. So um, yeah, I can't wait for that. It should be it should be it should be great. Excellent. And are you also doing some screenwriting? Is that right? Is that something that I saw? Yeah, no, I do do some screenwriting. I think it's uh, uh, I've got about sort of 10 original projects in development for for TV. So um, that's that's great fun. I think that's another great um, thing for writers to do in terms of learning about structure and learning about characters and building worlds and everything. I think um, uh yeah, writing for the screen is a great discipline, especially if you're writing commercial fiction or popular fiction. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'd highly recommend it. It's a, it's a great way of, um, A, it's a great thing. It's a great sort of um, alternative muscle to flex because novels are obviously extremely long and solitary. So you're sitting writing, you know, 400, 450 pages, um, whereas scripts are a lot shorter and, and uh you uh, particularly do sort of treatments and outlines and and thinking through stories. So it's it's a great, um, yeah, I like doing both. I don't do them at the same time, but I like doing, uh, when I finished a massive novel to go and then do some scripts is just, is great. Nice. And is that something that you're um, like doing for a production company or is that yeah, something? they're yeah. all production companies. So I say he's, I've sold the ideas to production companies and then developing with them and then uh, obviously going out to, to buyers and broadcasters and getting it funded and stuff. So, um, but uh, the development process is great again. You, you learn a lot and um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a great discipline, I think. Great. Um, I have more questions I could ask, but we're getting short on time. So I will just ask one last question. So now that you've been through it all, yeah, you're debuting. What would you say to yourself four years ago when you're starting? What advice would you give to a new or aspiring author who's trying to debut? Ooh, um, well, definitely read uh, read the sort of books you want to write. I mean, I know it's a cliche, but it's it's a very useful one. Um, and I think you just almost unconsciously then get used to what what works. And um, so that's the most important. And then I think secondly is is back yourself. I think that's the main one. I mean, uh, it, it is you you've got to go out and and sell your your idea to the world. So the most important thing is to sell it with confidence, sell it with um enthusiasm and and uh, keep going. So Matthew talked about his work in politics and how he picked up insights into human nature and how the world works. Where do you get your insights into the real world? 
Definitely not from politics. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Um, I, 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 I've combed newspapers looking for story ideas and I've never actually found one. Um, I subscribe to a bunch of like email newsletters, you know, like crimes of the, you know, the week, things like that. I have yet to get an idea that I can pull from there. Um, most of the time ideas just come to me completely out of left field. Um, and usually they don't become a book until I can take one idea and combine it with maybe a second or third idea, you know, kind of pair a couple things up together that don't necessarily make sense until you put them together and kind of create something unique. Um, but I, I, you ask any author, I don't think any of us really know where, where these story ideas really come from. I don't know. I know there's going to be chili pepper smoke burning some lungs in one of my next books. <laughs> that's a thing that's going to happen. Sulfur in the nostrils. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. A little science for you. Well, I thought it was cool how he talked about this concept about defining how big you want your audience to be. That's something that he learned from pot- politics. Um, understanding what your audience wants so he's got this unique premise but it's a universal one sleep is a universal fear for probably most readers or loss of control uh, what do you what did you think yeah. about that well i think that's why it resonates with all of us right i mean it's something we're all familiar with so it it, it hits home i i think when he you know just going back to the 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 writing the uh, speech writing thing um you can actually see reactions to a speech you know in real time so like that allowed him to basically grab hey this sentence resonates this one nobody cared about this one worked this one didn't um i think he you know as a screenwriter i think he carried a lot of that over so like th- this book didn't start you know like this this is in his debut novel i mean he mentioned that he He's got novels in the drawer. You know, this is a, a craft that's been honed over years and years and basically started with one, went to screenwriting where you have to perfect it. Um, and, you know, reading this book, like you feel those those story beats, the, the screenwriting beats in the novel itself. Like he basically has a formula that he's put together o- over time. Um, all of that kind of jumped out at me. I, I'm curious if any of you guys have done any sleepwalking. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> no. No. My son no? used to when he, he's outgrown it. But, yeah, he used to. It was kind of freaky i don't think i've ever done any sleepwalking but i've definitely i've had these moments we my wife and i call them freak outs where i will wake up and i some everything looks wrong in the room or it look i think there's something on the ceiling that's about to drop down on us or something like that i'll have those moments like a glitch in the matrix yeah yeah (laughs) i have had that moment where i've woken up yeah and it's like the entire room is is different than it should be like no, nothing that was on the wall. The walls are all blank. It's like I'm in a different space or a different version of the same space. That's because you're I've in a different a state lot. of consciousness. So there's names for that, Kevin. You're not alone. So it's, I got to get this right. Hypnagogic phenomenon when mm-hmm. you're going to sleep. Hypnopompic phenomenon when you're waking up. So you're still kind of in a sleep state, but you're also awake. So people have described like seeing things, feeling like they're falling through their bed, feeling like a cat is walking on their bed feeling like something is sitting on their chest happens to about 30% of people. Interesting. It's just weird sleep stuff. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to get creeped out, look up the hat man, which is a very common phenomenon. Oh, yeah. The hat you. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> One that I have seen. <laughs> it's crazy. I will not be looking up the hat man, just so that we're all clear. <laughs> My my sister used to sleepwalk when we were kids. Um, like we would hear noises downstairs, and we would go down, and we would find her. Like our our house basically went in a big circle, and she would run through the circle asleep, and she would turn on all the lights as she went through the first time, and then she would flick off all the switches the second time, and she would just keep doing that over and over again for like ten or fifteen minutes, and then go back upstairs and go right back to bed. Um, and we learned later it was because she was allergic to orange juice or had some type of reaction to orange mm. juice because it only huh. happened when she drank orange juice before bed. My daughter's got an issue with strawberries where where she does you know weird stuff if she has strawberries like within an hour or two of going to sleep. So I think things like that, I guess, can trigger that sort of thing. Um, but I guess that's that's kind of the point of this, right? Like he found a particular thing that impacts everybody. Everybody's got a story to tell. Everybody, you know, has something sleep related that resonates with them. Um, and, you know, like the, the, the premise of this book, uh, for those of you who haven't read it yet, is this girl is basically accused of murder. It looks like she did it, but she basically falls into a coma immediately after it happens. Um, so there's no way to prove that she actually did it. There's no way to put her on trial because she's in this coma. Uh, so for years, there's nothing but public speculation you know, on, on 
through social media and the news networks and things like that, um, which is what the story is, is built on. And that as a premise, you know, is unique. It's never been done before in a book. I mean, and, and it's also a very simple one. And those are the kind of things I think that seem to work really well. I think Riley Sager, when we had him on, he mentioned that if you can describe your, your book within, you know, four or five words, something really quick, um, it's probably going to sell well. And, and this is one of those types of, of books. You know, it's a very simple premise that can be described in a one sentence elevator pitch. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was cool too. Um, yeah, she fell asleep right after and was probably asleep while she did it. And I guess people do commit horrific crimes in their sleep and they drive and do all kinds of weird stuff. But yeah, just the idea of finding something that is universally terrifying to a, a large number of people is something that I've been thinking about. And it seems like loss of control is a pretty common one in thrillers. So Taxes. 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 Are, taxes are awful. Yeah. But it is cool to think about when you're coming up with your tagline, right? When you want that mm -hmm. high concept, what is something that can reach a large audience? Yeah. Yeah. And Matthew also talked about uh, audiences being very twist literate. So surprising them is hard. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, especially thriller readers, right? Because the ones that read a lot of thrillers, they've seen it all, you know, over and over and over again. And, you know, like Fourth Monkey, I mean, it sold so well because I killed my serial killer in the opening chapter. Like he's dead at the beginning of the book. Um, that's never been done before. It's like you, you need that type of twist. But that wasn't the, you know, that was a very early twist It's in, at the beginning. But I still had to throw two or three other ones in there in order to keep everybody, keep everybody going. Um, I tend to try and use those things almost like a, a against the reader. You know, if a particular twist has been done a couple different times, you know, try to make the story seem as if it's leading that way because then the reader is going to feel they know where it's going and then take it in a totally different direction. So kind of pull that rug out from under them. So try to use the, the trope or the twist against them. That's a good tip. Yeah. So we were talking about Matthew also does screenwriting and I'm like, I wish I had more time to ask about that. He said he had like 10 projects going. I, I want to ask, like, how do you even start with that? Because that's always something I've been like, it seems like an easy, well, not an easy, but maybe a, a natural slide in for book writers. So yeah. have you done any screenwriting? How have you started with that? I have. Yeah. I've done quite a bit, but I, I, and I've even had some things sell and, uh, it's, it's a very different muscle for sure. Like it's, it's storytelling wise. I mean, it's the same, but there's a lot of guidance out there for how to get a script right. And it's always in terms of the Hollywood studio model. Uh, but I'm more impressed by the guys who are out there writing and producing like the independent film stuff. Cause they, it's usually the beats are very different. And once you've actually kind of been in that world and you've seen like, this is what, you know, studios X, Y, and Z prefer. And then you see like a, a really good independent film, you, you, you can kind of see where they diverged from the formula. And I think that makes it even better more fun. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in doing. <laughs> so you said you got some stuff picked up. Like, did you just write something and then pitch it? Or did you have someone who wanted something? So yeah, I had a, so I worked in film and TV for, you know, the early part of my career. I was in film and TV, mostly on the documentary side. Uh, but I had written some stuff and I'd kind of been asked to do one script and it just never really went anywhere. Uh, but it did open the door for me to do some like spec scripts um, that did get picked up mostly on TV. Uh, but there, it, it, there's a, it's a really tricky market. Like if you're, it's harder to crack, you know, the screenwriting market uh, than getting into like traditional publishing, like the big five, you know, cause it's, there's, there is more opportunities, but they're very heavily, tied in with like the writer's guild and things like that, you know? Uh, so there's some markets that like, Oh yeah, plenty of market opportunity, but you're never going to get in because you're not a member of this specific group and you haven't, you don't have this specific list of credits, et cetera. Uh, but with the advent of like streaming services and things like that, there's a lot more opportunities are starting to kind of open up if people are interested in screenwriting. Yeah. It's a tricky thing, right? Because you write, you write a screenplay and if it doesn't sell, then it goes in a drawer somewhere and it basically never right. earns you anything. You know, at least, at least right. with a novel, you know, it's going to make you some money. Um, you I've got plenty of self publish that novel <clears throat> and, and still make something. Right? Yeah. But you can't really self publish a, a script. I mean, a I guess you could, right. or a screenplay. Yeah. You could, you could produce it on your own and you could go that route, but you've got to throw a lot of money behind it to actually get it made. Um, one of the things you're going to, you find when you get into the Hollywood world is that the, it's very 
I don't want to use the term clicky, but like there's a lot of groups that tend to work together. Um, yeah. So if a showrunner gets attached to your particular project, he's got certain screenwriters or she's got certain screenwriters that, that they prefer to work with. Um, so that list becomes very short. Um, and it, you know, it's always the same groups of people tend to work with each other for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a lot of money involved, you know, like you, you want to make sure that the people on your team are people you can work with and work well together. Um, so when you find a group like that, you tend to use that same group over and over again. Uh, but that just makes it that much harder to, to get into. Um, I know plenty of authors though, that will write the novel for their book and then they'll sit down and write the screenplay for that, that novel, um, and put both of them out there. Um, and it may never get picked up, but it is easier to get in front of directors and producers and things like that. If you already have a script that's been you know, written, um, even if it's not the one that actually gets used, uh, if you want a really good example of that, go out and uh, find the original script for pretty woman. It's available online. Um, it is a very dark, nasty, scary story. I mean, she basically dies at the end. It wasn't a comedy. It was so far from what was actually produced. Um, but you know, then Gary Marshall came aboard, uh, who was known for television co comedies. He brought in his own writers and they turned you know, a very dark script into a comedy. Um, you know, so like these things just take on a, a life of their own. Yeah. Yeah. I should say that every, everything I ever sold, it got the hell written out of it, uh, rewritten out of it. You know, it, it went through, there's probably like 10 different writers on every script that, that ever had my name on it. So it's, it, and none of them look anything like where I started, honestly. Yeah, it's just an interesting process. Uh, so JD. Who's up next week? Next week, we've got Jamie Attenberg coming on. She's the author of a book called A Thousand Words, A Writer's Guide to Staying Creative, Focused, and Productive All Year Round. Uh, she's going to basically fill us in on the book and offer some strategies to help authors stay consistent, productive, and get to the finish line with their books. Uh, so if you're having trouble hitting your word count goals, you won't want to miss it. Yeah, sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersandpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.